Hello everyone, welcome to episode 4 of our series in which we build a functional application in Scala from scratch. Uh, this is actually the second time I'm recording this because the first time there were some issues. For example, uh, I was struggling to uh, find a solution for the problem that I was trying to implement, which was handling errors properly in Tapir. Turned out there was an issue in the uh, HTTP for us uh, integration for it, now it's fixed. So we will be able to just use that without, uh, well, getting stuck for half an hour. And the second issue was that in the second half of the video, uh, the music that I'm playing, uh, the, the playlist that was copyright free ended. And because I didn't loop it, it like Spotify started playing random music, which was copyrighted. And I immediately got a copyright strike on four of the songs after uploading the video to YouTube. So that uh, didn't work. Now I just made sure that that's gonna happen again. <laughs> so we're gonna loop. Uh, hopefully that that's not no longer gonna be an issue. Um, and yeah, so the plan for today, uh, actually what I did last time, uh, like you, you didn't see this, but I'm just going to do it from scratch anyway. Like we are starting off from the branch, uh, from the, the commit that was on episode uh, three, um, with some like minor changes, which I'm gonna go through. And uh, these are SCAS Stewart PRs. Uh, so what we're going to do today is, well, look at what changed since last time. So just a couple of SCAS Stewart PRs. There's some more open right now that I'm going to look at and merge. And uh, we're going to go to the real stuff. So uh, testing the client server compatibility, which I think we were supposed to do in episode three, but we didn't uh, because we did uh, the native image. Uh, and we're going to look at logging and error handling, uh, mostly error handling and the compatibility testing. Like these two parts are going to be the main focus of, the, of this video. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, we'll see. We'll see in the end. Uh, so yeah, so let me show you what changed since, since last time. Uh, so that would be good log. So uh, so we have some updates from, from uh, Scott Stewart. Uh, well, yeah, I did a link to the episode after it was released, but uh, yeah, we got a SCAS Stewart PR for updating uh, Tapir. I just took it, merged it, and uh, that's 0.19.0 M10. I guess we started with M9. Uh, then there was a logback update, an SPTCI release update, I mean, it gets effect and scaf and T. Nothing major, just uh, small updates uh, of, of the libraries. Uh, also, uh, I noticed that some of you were actually implementing this project on your own. So I added a couple of links. If you also have one, if you are also working on this in your time, if you have a repository, uh, if you want it linked here and like show uh, how great our community here is, uh, then please feel free to send me a link in the comments or make a PR to this list in the readme. And I'll happily list your project here as well. Um, it would be really cool if we had more. So yeah, so this is where we'll start. And we'll start by looking at uh, uh, the pull requests to Steve. Um, so right now we have four open. I'm gonna go through them one by one. Uh, first one is HTTP 4S, so all the HTTP 4S modules. Uh, the history looks a little messed up. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to do uh, yeah, it, it looks messed up because I actually reverted the changes from the last episode. Uh, I think I'm just going to update this manually uh, this time just to you know, avoid a big mess in the history. Uh, I did a rebase on the main branch, which I'm not proud of, but well, that's life. Sometimes you have to do it. So I'm just going to update all these at once and close the PRs. Uh, SCAR 3 updated. Okay, I'll leave this one for last. Um, then we have another update of HTTP for us, which I guess uh, strange that it was updated separately, uh, but I guess it can sometimes happen. Okay, uh, then we have Tapir, uh, M11. We're actually gonna need this version because it fixes this issue that I struggled with last time, which you didn't see. Um, and yeah, so we have that. I'm going to open SBT, that's the easiest way to uh, to verify that this still compiles, just open this BT and reload if you if you change something. Um, yeah, it's still gonna close this. And the other one, I think there's one more, yeah, which I hadn't closed. 
Okay. Uh, but then there's the Scala update, which I have yet to see if we can even do do it. Uh, so yeah, we'll see. Um, okay. So let's run the tests. We don't have many tests, just the server ones, I guess, at this point. So some dependencies are downloading. Also today, I am hopeful that we're gonna get some smoother recording because I did some changes to the settings in OBS. Uh, we'll see. It's always a, a random puzzle. But I have high hopes. And also, I definitely figured out how to do like the audio, the noise cancellation. Uh, yeah, we have 95 more minutes of free noise cancellation, so that's good. Okay, I'm not super satisfied with this uh, speed of compilation, but it's all right. Uh, so yeah, we are, we were able to get all the dependencies. Now let's see if we can update Scala. Uh, the reason why it might not work is uh, compiler plugins. And okay, we don't have any. That's weird. Why don't we have better to string? I'm going to add that. It's a compiler plugin I made a while ago. Okay, I'm going to add it by hand. Uh, so it's now in the polyvariant group. Okay. Do it. And we updated Scala. Let's see if we can get that. Also, when we update Scala, we'll need to regenerate the GitHub uh, workflows. Uh, thankfully, that's just a single command. Uh, let's make sure we can get all the dependencies. And we can. And now let's do the test. And if that works, I'm going to uh, regenerate the GitHub sources. So, GitHub workflow generate. And yeah, now we will regenerate that. Let's see what changed. Uh, just the Scala version in the file, nothing else. Uh, the library updates. Yeah, I think we're fine. So I'm going to add that. And I'm going to actually push it. All right, I made some changes to the setup, uh, recording setup, because I think the SBT builds were too slow. Uh, hopefully it's going to be better now. We'll see. So, back to the actual content. Uh, I said we're going to do client server compatibility testing. So, by this, what I meant was that the code that we currently have in the server, uh, let, let, like, let's look at the main. Uh, the code that we have here, uh, we need to basically ensure that these endpoints, when exposed from a server and used by the client, by the client side, side executor, that they will just work. Uh, We've seen in the previous episodes, I think in episode two, uh, that it was quite difficult to debug some of the issues. And without tests, we would never have realized that there was something wrong unless we actually uh, launched the application, which we did. Uh, but with tests, it would have been faster uh, to realize that something was wrong. Um, in, in this case, that was an issue with Tapir, which is now fixed, but we cannot use it. We cannot use enums yet. Uh, actually, that was not a Tapir issue. It was a Magnolia issue, but still uh, around the same area, like not our fault. Um, and then we were trying to decode a server error, uh, which was there because the array was different. Like for in both cases, it, having tests would have been nice and uh, could potentially save us from even more such uh, such issues. Okay, I realized I had some leftover directories, which didn't even make sense because they were from a different project. They were probably empty, but for whatever reason, they were here. Anyway, uh, I'm going to create a new project in SBT uh, because I want the code from both the server and the client to be visible there because we will need this, a client site executor, which is visible in only client and the root project. And also we, we need to use server side executor like this code. Well, okay, not this code exactly, but this code, which will exact extract somewhere, actually more like this code, uh, which is defined in server. So to use both of them, I would need to either specify this, the tests in the root project, which I don't feel very comfortable with, uh, or in a separate project, which I'm going to do now. 
So uh, let's call it E2E. It's going to be a project and it's going to depend on uh, server and client. And as for dependencies, like extra settings or anything like that, I don't think we need any of that. So I'm going to just import the build in the meantime. Um, let's look at it. And yeah, I kind of already start creating like the directories for that. Um, so we do a source, Esca, Steve. Okay. And we can start creating files. So like, okay. This code sometimes does that. Yeah, this version is supposedly not, not supported by Metals yet, but I like to live dangerously and I've seen it work before. So I think it's fine. Uh, let's create our tests. So we are using mUnit again. Uh, so it's going to become pat tests. Not what I wanted to write. Uh, and this is going to be a cuts effect suite or cuts effect spec. I don't remember the name. Um, it's supposed to be a cast effect suite or fun suite. No, just like this. Okay, I, I know what's wrong. Uh, we don't have the common settings, which I added in my like, common settings. We need to uh, explicitly set that up. And because of that, we don't have the test dependencies from the other modules. Um, Maybe we should uh, change the dependency, like we could do this and like test, test, uh, compile, compile, but I think we can just do the settings for now. Uh, because we don't depend on the test sources of these projects, we don't need to add dependencies on the test sources for our test sources. Um, oops, it's clear. We only need like the production code of it. So like the client state executor, and the routing part of server main. Uh, we're going to extract this into something that we can reuse more easily because we don't want to start an Ember server uh, in order to run these tests. We want to do everything in memory. Uh, that's, that way it's going to be faster, easier to debug and, and so on. Uh, and yeah, so this apparently now compiles. Let me just import this. It's not gonna work, is it? Okay, import and what? Apparently this time I had to do it by hand. How about this? Okay, it doesn't work. Maybe this is broken in metals. Uh, we'll see. If I see this, see this one more time, I'll revert the scale upgrade uh, just to make it easier to work with. All right, so the first test uh, that I'm going to write is actually going to be very similar to what we have in the server side executor tests. So I'm just going to steal this for a moment. Mm. Then we're going to go from that and just make sure that it works. Okay, this test uh, works. So in here, uh, we use the server side executor. This is not what we want because this is an executor. Uh, we don't want to depend on the implementation of the server side executor. We just want to d deal with the interface. So instead, uh, I can have like any kind of executor really which is going to be used on the server side. And now I'm pretty sure this is this is, this is a weird error. Uh, maybe this is because of the Scala version. So I'm going to downgrade uh, just to be safe. In the meantime, I'm going to switch this effect to IO uh, because I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure at some point uh, we will want to have IO in these tests. So just so that it it's easier to change later. Okay, that looks better. I think let's revert. I want to see if the version downgrade helped. Apparently, it did. Although this type is kind of weird, uh, but this is just so. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so this is gonna be able. Yeah, no imports work. I think we're we're back home. And we cannot do this, we cannot do assert equals anymore because this is the right. How about IO? I'm not entirely convinced this is gonna work. Um, this is probably gonna be based on equality, which isn't defined this way for IO. Yeah, so we need something else, something like 
What if we run these two tests? Oh wait, uh, because this is just an IO pure, I think I can change this art assert equals to assert IO. Yeah, this one looks right. And just like this. Yeah, that was fine. Uh, yeah, so this is our first test, uh, but this is still the server-side executor instance. So, yeah, let's build the client now. Like, this is still to be changed. Get rid of server-side executor. So we'll make the client. Okay, and now we're missing an HTTP first client interpreter, which is fine, we can just define it. Uh, okay. And I'm not sure why this still... Oh, it compiles because this is a function now. This is scala free after all. By the way, this should be a given. Uh, I forgot we are in scala free. <laughs> um, and yeah, we have the instance, now we need to pass. So, so in Scala 2, this wouldn't have compiled. Uh, we would need something like underscore here. But this is now not required anymore. Uh, like, automatically, you will get convert like conversion to a function uh, anytime. If you specify the type, like a function type, in Scala 2, this would work. You wouldn't need the underscore. Um, but now you never need it anyway. So we want to provide this client, right? But we don't have one. And I said we were going to do something like client from HTTP app, uh, so that the HTTP app built from the routes, from the up your endpoints, is going to be used here to make a client. So when the client makes a call that's handled by the HTTP app or the HTTP routes, then we will run that. It's really like trivial logic kind of like most retrieval, because this app here, it's a class, right? So we could run this, uh, like with a request. So this basically does that, right? Like we have a request. Uh, it's changed, modified, like this is HTTP for S code, we didn't write it. And uh, there are some complexities to the whole model that we are not uh, looking at today. But still, like this is mostly, you know, simple code, like, except for the streaming part. But if you don't do streaming, uh, it's going to be easier. Um, anyway, client, when you look at client, like the basic method that you need to implement when you do a client is request to resource of response, right? And an HTTP app uh, is an alias for, can I find it? Okay, that's just scala 3 in methods, which doesn't uh, resolve type aliases this way. Uh, but I can tell you it's something like Lastly, f uh, request f response f. So running this like to a resource isn't that difficult, like in, in theory. Uh, the streaming part makes it more, more difficult, but uh, still the types are compatible, so implementing this is mostly trivial. Uh, anyway, so we want an HTTP app so that we can build a client from it. We don't have one. I mean, we do uh, in main, in the server main, uh, right here. Uh, this is an HTTP app. Uh, let me show you. Right? This is like a full HTTP app, and we can build the client from this. Except we can't reuse this for now, so I'm going to extract this somewhere else. We're going to call it uh, routing. Uh, it's not going to be an algebra, it's just going to be like a, a, a constructor, a factory method, call it, call it what you want. Um, it's going to be an HTTP app, F, and it's going to take a service, a, an executor. And so it's going to be basically the implementation here. Uh, we'll need to get rid of all the F, all the IOs, and change them into F. F from import. Um, and I'm going to name this implicit. And also, the server interpreter, we might need some constraints for this. Okay, it says monad, but I don't trust that. 
we need async. This is an issue. Uh, there is a ticket open in Scala 3 for this. Uh, like you get a confusing error here. I think we saw that in one of the previous episodes. Uh, but basically it says couldn't find instance of monad because monad is a super type of async and we are actually missing an async and it traverses the structure and just shows the first thing that it finds, even though it's not accurate. We need async and showing that it's a monad is super misleading. So anyway, we have this. Uh, I'll need to make the client, the executor a given. So this is an executor IO. And we're going to use routing instance IO. And I'm just going to inline this. Okay. And now we can actually reuse this in the combat test. So we can say uh, routing uh, instance IO. And we'll need to make the executor a given. And now it kind of works. So instead of using the executor and testing that, we'll do it like the client executor, right? Which, which is also an executor, but it's the, the client one. Uh, and this should still work, this test. Okay. And I'm going to show you what the point of this whole thing was. We do not start a server on, on any TCP port uh, in, in the process of testing this. Like this test does no networking at all. Uh, but it's going to actually test the, the protocol, like the, the endpoints and the model, like the decoding and coding logic. And I can prove that by exhibiting the bug that we found in one of the previous episodes. So if I make this an enum again, and let's, yeah, let's do the refactor. Just <laughs> A reminder of what we why we like enums in the first place, and let's run this again. It's going to blow up with a stack overflow exception error. So yeah, so this is why we need these tests. And even though that's just one case, which does two calls, which is arguably not good, uh, we're gonna split it in a second. It still gives us some gives us some cool stuff, right? Some the ability to tell that things are working to some extent on the decoding and encoding layer. This is kind of like an API test, but you don't really call the APIs yourself. You, could, you don't say which endpoint exactly you want to call. That logic is embedded in the client, in the client side executor. Like this says that we want to run the build endpoint and we don't need to repeat that logic. If we had like a strict requirement to have a specific API, and it was like a you know globally available public API, we would probably want to make sure that the API doesn't accidentally change. Like any moment I change the protocol, the endpoint here, this could be a breaking change, right? Our client will still work. Like if I, if I change the path here, this is going to pass because the client is also aware, like both the client and the server are aware of this value and they take the definition of the endpoint from that. So this is like the, the whole power. And for building apps that are sort of private and local and run together, this is pretty nuts because you can make changes to the API very easily. If just the representation changes, for example, if I change the, uh, the HTTP method, I also don't have to do anything else. It just works. Uh, but if this was a distributed application, it's going to actually be uh, two separate applications, right? Uh, then you still need to think about what the breaking change what change is going to be breaking or uh, whether it's not going to break. Um, in our case, I don't think we will define tests that work this way. Like this exact path, this exact method has to respond with this result. Uh, I think for, for the purpose of this project, it's going to be a little waste of time. Maybe one test just as an example, but uh, I'm going to just rely on the test, like this kind of test. Uh, except we're going to split this because this is too big. That's two things, two commands uh, at once. Okay, so we have the client, we have the server, the server executor instance. Actually, I think I'm going to make this parameter not a given because now you see we have two, two executors and like which one is which. This only proves that executor should not be treated as a type class, at least in the code that touches both implementations. 
Uh, so we have a couple of choices. Like we could say this is a uh, server and we could pass it by using server, I think. Yeah, right, we would need to specify like using async IO and then server, which I don't really like that much. Anyway, since so this code is only used, uh, like this given is only used in here and it's only passed once in one place, I think we can just make it a parameter. And actually, I'm just going to pass it this way. Uh, so just a normal parameter. And here also we'll pass it like this. Okay. So now I said I wanted to get rid of the server side executor. Uh, we can very well do that, but we'll need some other instance of this executor. For example, let's make an anonymous one. Okay, I was hoping that Metals would complete this for me, but apparently not. Not in scale 3. Okay, now obviously our tests are gonna fail. That's good. Um, so I want to kind of unit test this. So I want to specify for this input, for this build, give me this kind of response, like a hash, uh, give me maybe a failure of some sort. Uh, sooner or later, we will have builds that are failing and failing in a manage manageable way. For example, if you use an invalid image reference, I want that to be a, like a typed error. It's still gonna be not gonna be part of the type here, but it's, it's going to be a specific kind of throwable. Mm, so I want to have something like a mapping from inputs to outputs for each of the endpoints. So I'm going to do that. And this is going to be, mm, yeah, like build, build function or build impl. This is going to be a map of mm, build to either a probable or a hash. I'm using throwable here and not a specific type of error because we don't have the, the error type yet. Uh, it is going to be throwable anyway. And also I want to use these tests to check like unexpected errors as well in the future. Um, so this should not be a function, just a map uh, with two type parameters. Um, this is now going to fail compilation. And we'll have another parameter, which is going to be run impl. Same idea, uh, a map from hashes to either throwable or system state. You could use IO instead of either, doesn't really matter that much. But because this is just a data type, like either is a data type, you can expect it in more, um, more ways than an IO without running it. So now I'm going to build that. I'm going to call these functions. So build and pull. I guess you can just look up directly. We could use .get and handle the missing keys somehow, but I guess I don't need to. Um, so this, we need to lift to an IO. And for this, I'll need to import cat syntax. Same for run. Okay, and we have the implementation, so this is going to be like a test server or like test executor, actually. And we can later extract this to a separate file, maybe, maybe reuse it in other tests as well. Um, the possibilities are endless. So, I'm going to define like a test instance that we'll use in the client. Uh, we, you could do this like in every separate test, you could set, have a separate client and executor instance. There's no problem with that. Then you wouldn't really need this map. You could just return a new executor like this, right? Like, a, you know, implement just the paths that you are interested in, um, or just the outputs that you're interested in. Uh, but I guess I, I want to reuse that, that single instance in all the tests. It's going to be less code anyway. So our executor is going to be an executor, of course. And this is going to be test executor. And yeah, let's define a couple of inputs and outputs. So for now, I'll do just map empty in both. Just make sure that we are using that. 
and yeah I, I think I want to reproduce the logic that we have in the server right now so we're gonna have like a good build uh, instance which is going to be a build that returns like a proper result right so this is going to be build empty and we're gonna have a good build result which is going to be the, the hash that's like the output of the build implementation for it um we don't have a hash empty we can just do vector empty here and the idea is to use it like that uh good build will result in this good build result as right so this wraps a value in either using the right uh, branch so this should give us uh, half of the logic. So for the build and run part, we'll have the build part. I'll implement the run part as well, and then we'll split the test. So for the run part, we'll have the good build result, or actually we can you know separate it out so that we don't need to know that this is the result of the build operation and call it like good hash. Um, it could very well be a different value. Uh, just for now, it needs to be the same one because it's passed to the client again. Uh, so this will be a good run result. That's right. We're going to have to define that. And it's going to be a system state. And yeah, we're going to use system state empty, except does it, does it exist? It doesn't, but we can pass an empty map. Okay, now the problem is Oh yeah, uh, just the parenthesis was in the, the wrong place. So this was a tuple of map and the result, but it should be, you know, like this even, I don't think this would compile th this whole expression. Um, yeah, so there's like two errors, two type errors. Okay, uh, we should be good. And the tests are green, so we're good. So now I'm gonna split this test into two. So we're gonna, I'm gonna start by copying it. And this is gonna be run empty image or empty hash. Run hash successfully build image successfully. So we're just gonna do the build part here. And in the result, we'll expect a good build result. That works. And now here we're gonna do the second thing. We're gonna run, uh, actually not build empty. We're, we need to use the good build. And here, um, yeah, let's, let's focus. Uh, we're gonna run the good hash and compare it with the result, which is good hash uh, result, good run result. Okay, and to be honest, I think, yeah, I, I think like for now, there isn't much value in having having these vowels, but when we start adding failing cases, we will want to reuse them between like uh, the executor instance and the tests. Actually, like even now we, we do, we still have to reuse that, like this is used twice. Uh, we could repeat the, you know, the system state in here and in here, but you know how error prone this can be. Uh, so I just create files for that created. Okay, uh, so for the for the successful cases, I think we're fine. I'm going to commit. So downgrade scala. And success that's for compatibility. Okay. And yeah, now we can start looking at the failing cases. Uh, this is going to be fun because we'll need to deal with the error handling of Tapu, uh, which I did struggle a lot last time I tried to record this. So I'm going to say like build internal error and it is going to be a throwable and just a new throwable actually. Yeah, I think this is what I want. Uh, so when we try to build that, 
called. Yeah, uh, but okay, this should be. A, we need a build for this. So like, um, unexpected failing build. It's going to be a build, and we're gonna build from uh, build base. So empty image, okay. And we're gonna have one command. And let's use whatever commands we have. Yeah, let's use just up delete. Um, just some key, doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, just something that's different in the value from the good build. So that the map lookup uh, re results in a different thing. So an expected failing build will fail with uh, built into error as left. Okay. Now let's add a test for it because we don't have one. Unexpected error. So when we run this, this was unexpected failing build. We we want. Well, we need to attempt on this, otherwise the I.O. is going to fail. And I don't think there is a, a combinator for that. So search I.O. attempt, and it's going to be... Yeah, what is it going to be? So I think I don't want to expose the every detail of internal errors to the client. I think we need just like a generic error message for most of them. Uh, for the unexpected ones, we'll just return like internal server error, and that's it. So I'll create a new variable for this, unless I already did this. Um, let's just stop this out. So we don't have one yet. So I'm going to define it right here. I'm going to call it generic uh, server error. Mm. And I think we'll just add like a message Field, although it's always going to be the same, I think. And it's going to be an exception. Yeah, okay. So the equality of this case class will be based just on the field, on the on the message field, not on like the stack trace or whatever, because it's a, a case class. So that serves us right. Uh, I'm not sure if this is like the, the right design pattern, but if it hits us, uh, unexpectedly for some reason will know. So this is like a learning experience. Um, so we're gonna derive the codec and the schema for this because we're gonna need them. And here I want to have like a generic server error. Um, doesn't really matter what we say here. Uh, just note that this is, this is different from the internal error here. And I think we, we can actually inline this be, because we want to be reusing this. This will never reach the client. Okay, now we have a failure because we need to wrap this on uh, in a left. Now the test is going to fail because this is clearly not going to be a generic server error. We got like a decoding error from Tapir, that's fine. Um, and we're going to do the same for running the hash the run method. So run hash. So let, let's just do it's like a common convention for the names. For the test names. Um, I want to see like a summary. I guess we can't. Un until they all speed it won't look very nicely. Um, but yeah, so we need to change this to use the run method actually. And we'll use like unexpected failing hash. Let's define that. Now we need to define some hash, so. Let's use like vector width, I don't know, 42. Also, the, a good reason to extract these instead of repeating yourself is that 
when the structure of the hash changes and it's no longer like a vector of bytes, because I don't know if it's going to be a vector of bytes. Uh, that was just a temporary solution. If you remember, we first used array, which had its own problems because arrays don't have equality defined like other sequences in Scala. And also they are mutable. Vectors are not. Uh, so yeah, I changed to vector. But in the end, you know, this could be like a string or like a number, whatever. So it's just... Yeah, th this approach of defining these values here allows us to, you know, get, uh, delay that problem. Like when, when the structure changes, we only have to change it in like these values. And also uh, this pattern works pretty well in my current company. We have like a single file in which many of these values are defined for testing. And then when the structure changes, we actually have just that one file for like hundreds of tests. So that's pretty nice. Uh, when you add like a new field, you just specify it there and you only add it where you need it to be tested. Um, but everything still compiles and runs with little to no changes. All right, so this should still be failing and it is. So yeah, so we need to work on the server implementation. Um, so in routing, uh, this is where we define all the endpoints. And this is our server interpreter. So there's several ways that we could do like generic error handling. One of them would be to like handle the error on the level of the HTTP app. If we import like class effect or class implicits, uh, we could do like on error and handle this. For example, I don't know, case E, um, return like a response, like a bad uh, internal server error. And I was thinking of using this from HTTP for us. Uh, right, so you can define like a, let me just get this to compile. I guess we might need a DSL. Yeah, uh, I, it's just too much trouble to get the DSL. Okay, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna just do it. So if you want, want like an effect polymorphic DSL, you need to get it that way. Um, yeah, it wants a class lane. Okay, so the way I did this here is on the HTTP forest layer, we would catch any exceptions, like any throwables and return an internal server error. But then if we wanted to return like a generic server error as the body, and like an unfailed, we would need to encode this to an entity. And to do that via Cersei, we would need to add another dependency because we don't have the HP for us Cersei module. We would need to add it or, you know, handle this ourselves. So like set the content type of the response and also the, uh, like encode the, the value as a, as a string or as a stream of bytes, actually. So it's quite a lot of work, extra work that we need to do. Like we would need to get a, an extra dependency just for this, even though we wouldn't be using the HTTP first Cersei logic for anything else. We use Tapir to handle the decoding and encoding for our JSON structures. So why would we use this, uh, this other library uh, or do it ourselves? Uh, it would be best if we can use Tapir to have like a consistent source of of truth for this, for how to encode and decode stuff into responses. And that's actually what we're gonna try to do. So the server interpreter takes an optional parameter, like there's another overload here that takes a server options object. Uh, so the pattern is basically, um, the default is like default, um, that's just like a thing. We could use this, that's, that's basically equivalent to what we did before. But we can also use like custom interceptors uh, dot options, and we can now customize some of the settings here. So interceptors are like a like, like kind of like middlewares for uh, for HTTP for S, but in Tapirland. So this is what they call it. Uh, it's like there's a bunch of like predefined interceptor kinds, 
Uh, I think the whole point is so that this logic isn't duplicated between server implementations for Tapir. So this is not tied to HTTP first, for example. This is also effect agnostic and probably doesn't even depend on cats. So they have this this type, like custom interceptors, where we can define things like intercepting met for metrics or like custom uh, rejection interceptors. So what happens when you get uh, when you like forget a field uh, or or use their own name. But we're interested in the exception handler the most right now. So, uh, so we can specify that. Like this is the default behavior, by the way. This is exactly what happens in like dot default. If you don't believe me, we can go there. Uh, there we go. So let's take this and let's define the exception handler. Uh, and I'm going to try this, this overload. Let me actually see what this type is. Um, yeah, it's a trait. Um, I guess we can implement it as a single abstract method, or we could use this. No, that's the default. So the default, I guess this is what is being used right now. Uh, we get an internal server error and a, a plain text message. Uh, we don't want that, so we'll specify our own. So let's say we get the exception here. The exception context, let's call it EC. Uh, brings some bad memories, this name. Uh, let me know if you get the reference. Um, yeah, it would be even funnier if it was implicit. But... So here we have the probable that failed, uh, but that was the cause of the whole thing. Uh, we have the endpoint, which is Kind of nice. We have the endpoint during which, like when we were processing, processing this endpoint call, uh, we got the failure. And we also had the request, uh, which is nice. So we could like actually probably run the request through the endpoint. The request contains a bunch of stuff like the headers, I guess, uh, the, the URI, everything basically, body. Uh, maybe not the body. Yeah, the situation with bodies is probably more complicated, especially with streaming. So. Mm. But we're not going to use any of that, actually. Uh, I think we are fine with like no information from the input whatsoever. Uh, we just need to return, uh, if we go back to exception handler on top here, uh, we just need to return an option of a valued endpoint input. So let's try that. Uh, endpoint output, of course, not input. Uh, so this takes two things, an endpoint output and the value of it. Uh, so this is like a type of definition of, for example, in the endpoints, like this is an endpoint, um, like this can be an endpoint output. Let's just try to use that. So just in body of generic server error. We'll need to import top here, JSON Cersei. See, so this is a valid uh, endpoint output. Like if we if we went through like all the hierarchy of this type of this body type, like the parent traits or classes, we would get to endpoint output. Or there's an implicit conversion, but I don't think there is one. I can't see anything any conversions, but that might be just metals. Uh, anyway, this this passes as the the right type here. So now we just need the generic server error, and I'm gonna just blatantly steal this from my test because this is exactly what I want here. Okay. And the tests are still failing, which is not unreasonable, but do note that it's a different kind of failure. So we expected a generic server error uh, with server failed, but we got like a JSON decode exception and we failed to decode adjacent values. So this is a slight indicator that we actually have, like actually a strong indicator that we already have adjacent value. It's just not matching the expected result, which for this endpoint, uh, which in this case, this was the run endpoint. So we expected a, a system state. 
So we expected the all key, and that's actually part of the error. And the all key one was missing, but what we'll find is that the message key was present. Let's run the server. And let's try to call it. I think this was a post. And the input is, yeah, value. Oh yeah, there's, I always forget this, there's the API prefix. Okay, so this was successful because we have still a server that defines this one input that works. But if we use anything else, now we have an okay, so that's not good. Uh, so yeah, we forgot to set the status because the status had to be explicitly set. If you look at exception handler, uh, let me just check how much more space we have, okay. Um, if you look at the exception handler, uh, we'll see that it defines a response in the status code. Um, yeah, most importantly, it specifies the status code. Like this is a bit of a convoluted way to do it, but it works. So we still need to do it. Uh, we still need to do it here. So we can just say and status code. Um, status code. General server error. Okay, this is probably not. Uh, yeah, we will need to import it. Uh, okay. Also, I just realized I've been using the wrong style of imports, and this should be covered by Scalafix at some point. For now, it isn't. And when we reload the server, it should now be an internal server error. There we go. And the successful case still works. Now, you may be wondering why this was an, a 200 OK. It's just that by default, all the endpoints will return that code. Uh, so maybe in these, we should be changing like the results to something like 201 accepted, or whatever. Uh, but 200 OK is absolutely fine for me uh, for now. Okay, uh, so let's run the test again. Uh, it's still gonna fail because the client is not aware of how to decode this, this value. And also the client is only aware of okay responses. It's not aware that the endpoint can return something else. This is why previously it tried to decode the response as uh, the, the system state uh, because it saw like the status code matches. So let's try to decode that. But right now, the status code doesn't match, so it has no way to, to decode the output, the, the, the endpoint's output, into what it wants. So we need to change some things in the client. Uh, and I realized in our client side executor, and I thought how to do it the best. And I think the easiest way is going to be just like the handler that we get from HTTP4S, uh, from a type of HTTP4S. We don't need to use it. It's just a function that will deserialize a response to an effect of either, whatever. But we don't have to use it if, for example, we know that it's going to fail. This way we avoid the problem of like decoding the response twice, like reading the response body twice, which we shouldn't do because it's a streaming, uh, streaming thing. Uh, so potentially on the second read, it could be uh, impossible to read it again because we don't keep all the bytes in memory. So what we can do instead is we have access to the response before we read it. So we can say like if uh, the status is status um, internal server error, we'll do something. And otherwise, we'll use the handler to decode. And I'm actually going to refer here. OK. And again, uh, here we got. Uh, the, the raw like response object, we have access to that body, um, which is entity body. This is a stream of bytes, uh, but we also have access to body body text. This is a stream of strings, probably. Yeah, this is a stream of strings. I'm going to just consume all that stream and decode it into a generic server error. So, compile string. 
By the way, uh, there's better ways to decode streaming JSON bodies. Like in this case, it might be a better idea to use something that doesn't parse the whole body and then decode to some type. You might instead want to use something like um, FS2 data, I think, allows you to do this. Just like select given fields and ignore everything else if you have a huge, potentially huge body. Or we could use something like JSON Inter, a different Scala library that um, doesn't use a JSON AST, uh, or at least doesn't decode the whole body to a JSON AST, which is kind of nice. Uh, but in this case, like you know, I am in control of the server. I know that the body will be manageable. It will not be you know a hack of sorts. Like nobody will will try try to. Um, do a denial of service attack against me because I am the server. I am the one who knocks. So we compiled the string and now this is going to be an effect of a string and we can flat map on it. Can we? Oh yeah, we, we, we need a compiler, an FS2 compiler. I'm going to add that here. Um, or F -F. This means like a compiler from a stream of F to an F. Uh, this is only gonna work for like actually effectful streams because if you had like a pure stream, uh, compile to list. Uh, this would be a stream of like nothing or FS2 pure, which is basically nothing, uh, to ID. So I think this would be just a list of int. Let's try. I just want to prove this to myself. Yeah, I think we, you don't even need to compile. That's, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, a similar situation can be if you have like errors, if you have an either with throwable. Uh, anyway, if you look at the compiler, there's like, oh yeah, I forgot. You can compile to a resource, so I guess this makes sense. Uh, and this is the one that we are using right now. And then there's the ID ID instance and this one. So from fallable, which is a custom trait. Yeah, so the effect changes. So I guess there's a point to having all of that. And then from pure to ID, you see? So we are okay with just keeping the same error, uh, the same effect type because we, we want the same error, uh, the same effect type anyway. So we will get an f of string, and then we can flat map that. Uh, I'm not going to use what <laughs> GitHub Copilot suggests here. I'm going to do to parse this as JSON with Circe. I'm going to decode it directly to joining server error. This is still going to do a JSON AST. It's just not, we don't have to deal with the uh, types, and I will. I'll lift this to IO again, to F actually. And this should be, yeah, I'm bad with names. And this should be an F of generic server error, it is. And because generic server error is a failure and we cannot return it just in the effect, we need to refrow it to put it in the error channel. So uh, I'll pop up on this and do raise error. F. Oh, and that should fix the test. Okay, that has succeeded. We did get a stack trace in here, but that's fine. That's just the behavior of the top here uh, error handlers. So, so that's good. Um, and I think I could have mentioned this in the second episode that we didn't see any logs when we had a throwable in the the server. So the problem was that in Tapir, they didn't catch all throwables. They only caught like ex exceptions. Now they catch non-fatal, which my throwable is. Uh, it's not like a out of memory error. Uh, so they catch all the throwables and we are able to see the logs because they catch it before logging and then they pass it to the exception handler. So that's good. And these logs can be ignored. I guess we could also disable them because this is uh, SLF4J. So in our logback config, uh, for the tests, we could disable the logging, but I don't really care that they are there. I'm fine with this, so yeah, I'm gonna leave them uh, in here. At some point, this may 
come in useful so yeah let's look at what we did so far uh, so we have four tests in here we have one for the good build uh, one for the good run and two failing cases so these are for the generic server errors uh, so for anything that's a throwable that we don't handle in a specific way when we add typed errors to the endpoints we could actually do it and we actually will i'll define like a, a simple error adt uh, but we, when we do this type will change and then we'll have to also test that this is working so let's just commit what we have right now okay all right so i mentioned we would be adding an uh, a typed error channel to well typed error channel is a bit too much to say but the endpoints will be typed and because of that the clients will be able to read the the error type um, so uh, for now the endpoints are both defined with nothing as the error type i'm going to tdd this kind of so we'll try to add errors for building and this is going to be like Mm, let's say unknown dash r. So this is going to be unknown dash build or unknown base. And this is going to be a bad build result, but in a different way. Uh, this is going to be mm, build dot error dot unknown base and this is gonna be i think a hash actually uh, this is going to be uh, we're gonna have this value for reuse let's call this hash uh, vector i don't know one so i'm gonna copy this and we're gonna use like uh, unknown base error that's left wait that's defined it's not it's just okay uh so unknown base error is going to be this it still won't compile right let's just make it to a throwable for now and comment it out we also need an unknown base build So this is going to be a, an empty build, except actually, yeah, it's going to be an empty build, uh, but with like an image reference as the base. And this is going to be the same hash, so like hash vector one. Uh, so maybe val unknown hash. I'm going to reuse that as well. And this is going to use unknown hash. Something is still odd here. Uh, not very compiling. Is it? Okay, this might be a very trivial issue that I cannot see right now. Unknown base error is uh, throwable. It's still left. Oh, we need to attempt. Yeah, because this couldn't be an either, it just returns a uh, hash in the result. So this is not implemented, that's good, because it, that's true. Um, we need to also add it to the text executor so that it's aware of that. So, uh, no base build. Actually, that's just it. Yeah. Okay, so we still have unimplemented, uh, not implemented error. So I'm going to define this error, error hierarchy. Uh, in the model. So the build is going to have uh, an error type. It cannot be an enum yet, so that's going to be a little burial plate. And I said this would be a non base. And it's an error. Then we're going to also derive 
uh, codec and schema. And I guess we can use this code now. It's gonna compile, but it's gonna fail. Okay, it doesn't fail yet. Oh, because it's not a probable. So the errors are gonna be exceptions, like all of them. Uh, so exception with product with serializable. That's some weird formatting, very long line. And yeah, we got a generic server error. Um, wait a sec, I don't, I don't like this. Okay, so this failed, probably because this map, no wait, that's just weird. Okay, I need to understand what happened here. Right, uh, so we returned, like we failed the effect with uh, throwable, which is an exception actually, but because there's no special handling for that, it's an internal server error for uh, for our endpoint. So this, uh, the whole exception handler actually runs here, like this exception will be visible here. Uh, I think we can do that. Uh, just wrap this in a, in a block. So we're gonna see this exception here somewhere. Mm, I think that's it. Exception context. Yeah. So that's, yeah, the probable goes first and we have some more info like the whole endpoint, which is called, but run internal error is that's not accurate, is it? Why is it a run internal error? I think something's wrong. Oh, it's a different, it's a different test, is it? Yeah, we are, yeah, I was looking at the wrong output. Uh, we are looking at, we're gonna look at unknown base in the output. There it is. So it got caught in the exception handler. We don't want that. We want to handle it explicitly in the in the, in the protocol in the endpoint, so we will. Uh, let's just remove this uh, line from the handler kind of thing. So the endpoint is built, and currently it has no output. Let's change it so it's actually built dot error. The types are not gonna match, so we need to specify like error out, and this is going to be a JSON body of build error. Uh, now, it would be nice to specify the code, because I think by default this is 400. Uh, we can actually test that by hand. What's the problem here? Okay, I guess the problem is... What's the problem? Oh yeah, it's server logic infallible. We need to change that to uh, recover errors. Yeah, so it will catch the throwables that match this type, like this uh, this type uh, build.error and convert them to endpoint errors, which I guess makes sense. So we're on the server. But we'll need to call the build endpoint, which now I realize was a mistake. We should have used uh, run to make it easier. Uh, base is going to be Oh, right, we cannot see it. We would need to handle it in the server. Um, okay, let's actually do that. So, um, as empty hash, let's do, or else, uh, build equals build, build place uh, reference, hash, for one, for example. Doesn't really matter uh, what we use here. If that's true, we'll return um, we need another hash, right? 
Yeah, that, that, no, we don't need a half wing defiler. Uh, I'm wondering because we need to refrow that, so I'm gonna have to make some more changes to the code. Uh, so build error. Uh, I'm only going to do this once to show you how the like what the default error code is gonna be. And oh my god, race rf hash. So this is an f, but this is just an option. This is not gonna work either. Um, okay, I'm gonna do this in the like worst option imaginable. So um, I'm gonna pattern match in the build. Okay, in the case that the build is what we want here. Then we're gonna do a non bake with her. Otherwise, you know what? I'm not even gonna catch the others. I'm gonna be this disrespectful. I don't care. It's not exactly if I don't care, but we can do this in production. Uh, so the base is gonna be I think we need an object with uh, a hash, so like value one. Okay, and then we have commands in the build, right? Yeah, commands is going to be just an empty uh, array, and also this needs to be all equals. Okay, we sent an invalid body. Uh, oh, yeah, this needs to be wrapped as well. So hash. And on base. Okay, so this is a bad request. So exactly what I wanted to show. So we can change that by saying what the error out status is. And so and status code. Actually, I think I'll do this first. So and this is gonna be a status code. Um, I think unprocessable entity is four two two. Yeah. And I've seen this used um, a couple of times. It's always like a problem, like what kind of error do we want to return when the body is valid, but the request cannot be fulfilled because the client said, sent the wrong value. So I guess this is a reasonable uh, status code for that. Okay, there we go. So this works. Uh, the default code, like if we had any kind of other body. Yeah, server failed. So this is just an internal server error, a generic internal server error. Okay, so we're fine here. I'm gonna revert the changes to the server out of respect for all of you and myself. That's a stale warning, by the way. Maybe it's time to connect the bloop again. So yeah, the tests are now passing. Apparently, so thanks to this change that we made in the client, uh, client side executor. Uh, actually, no, we didn't make any change here. That's pretty cool. Uh, the only change that we made was in the server side executor, or actually the routing. Uh, so that this is no longer like infallible if recover errors. Um, we can only use infallible if the, ex the endpoint. Uh, says that it returns nothing as the error type. So yeah, so we added this error structure to uh, our endpoint. So the compat tests now work. So this means that the client is also able to uh, handle these typed errors. All right. Okay, so I'm going to leave this type, although like all the, the whole model is still up for potential change. Like I only did the simplest thing that I wanted to, to have, uh, just these two commands for now, uh, but we can still change this. Although I don't want to make too many changes to the model while we cannot use enums because it's just so much writing compared to the world without enums, uh, with enums. Mm. Hopefully that's gonna be the next episode. I hope that we, we just need like a tapir release, a, a tapir milestone, which I already asked for.
Um, so yeah, so this is it for the typed error. I'm going to just commit that. I'm not going to do it for the run endpoint uh, yet. Um, just because there's no point. Like we already did this kind, this one kind of test. But that's, it would be just more of the same. So I'm not going to show that. And yeah, um, it would probably be worth compiling the project again and running it uh, with the native image agent and adding some configs because that could have changed uh, in the meantime. We also updated the dependencies so this might not be the correct config anymore. This is from like uh, episode 3. Uh, I don't think like too much has changed but there are different code paths so we do cannot really know. Uh, but I don't want to spend time on this in this episode. All right, so I think we can also look at the logs today because we did our handling, we did the testing for compatibility. We can also look at logs. Although I did mention I was going to do like a routing test, so we'll do that as well. This can be in the server side uh, test, so like uh, routing test. Let's do that. It's not going to take too much time. So what I'm going to do here, I'm still not going to uh, start an actual server, but I'm not going to use, I'm, I'm actually going to test the, the server uh, in separation from the client. So uh, let me just show you what I mean by that. We'll define the, like an instance of, of the server, of the executor and wrap it in routing. But for this, I think it's worth re extracting this code and uh, this. So I'll move this into the shared sources into the shared test sources. Mm. I could actually leave it like this as a top level definition. Um, but I'm not sure how the import resolution is going to work, like how good this is going to be for in metals. Uh, I'm just going to Wrap it in an object. And import some stuff from cats. Okay. Uh, now we need to add dependencies, like uh, test dependencies between projects. So this will be test, test, compile, compile. I'm going to copy paste this because it, there isn't too much of it. And sometimes you want to opt out of the behavior, I guess. Actually, no, I'm going to reuse this. So also, if you know a better pattern, uh, please let me know. So I'm going to use this or maybe something like full. Yeah, this looks nice. So something like full shared. And I guess that's all that's import. And in the compat test, we're going to use that. So test executor, I guess, yeah, we can just change this. And give FPT some time to import. Okay. Done. We should be able to use this code. Uh, the test executor. What did I call it? Oh, just test executor. Yeah, let's rename it. Okay. Um, does it still run? Okay. I'm actually going to run all the tests. Uh, 
I think we didn't. Yeah, we need to add one more line in SPT. We need to aggregate uh, the E2E sources. So that's uh, a bummer. But in the meantime, we can already, already start writing this. So. I think we're going to do a single test for the run endpoint in which we do like a successful case. Uh, that's, I think, what, what will be a good uh, example. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a request manually, like using the HTTP for us DSLs, uh, and send it. We will need to use either HTTP for us or, or set the uh, content type ourselves. But I think that's all right. So actually, another import. Uh, so in the server test, we're going to have Cersei just in the test scope. Uh, let's import again. But in the meantime, I'm able to run all the other tests. Uh, so both the server side executor tests are going to run, did run, and now the compat tests run. So that's good. Uh, if I didn't do this, the CI would also not run these tests, which is kind of uh, bad. And also, I think since we added the E2E module, our CI might actually be failing because we should regenerate the workflows. And also, I did downgrade Scala when, and I didn't regenerate the sources, uh, the workflows. So I'm going to do that in the meantime. OK, so now, uh, what did I do that last import for? Oh, yeah, I just prefer sourcing. So I'm going to import a uh, Cersei entity codec. Always oh, the wrong syntax. I'm also going to get a uh, client DSL IO. What else do we need? What do you mean that's not available? Oh yeah, we need to add that as well. Here we go, SPT. The client DSL should be fine. Yeah, at least we don't need to do the workflows again. But the workflows change every time we add or, or remove a project, I think. Apparently not when we don't do don't do publishing, so that's fine, I guess. So just the cover version. Let's wait for this one final import. Hopefully that's the last one I need to do. And failed. Uh, why? Because probably I used the wrong module. Client DSL doesn't exist. I guess it's just built in into client, isn't it? We can actually check that in SPT here faster. Uh, so server test compile. Who's going to be the first? Probably uh, Metals is going to be first. Okay, it uh, looks like the, the dependency was resolved and also we have access to this. Yep, no need for no need for SPT again. Why did I even start this? Anyway, we can use uh, the DSL now. Also, if you're not if you're wondering why these imports are, I'm not getting like warnings for unused imports or why did I not enable them? They're not there in Scala three, not yet. I like to complain about this because eventually maybe they will implement this and then I'll be able to praise them. Um. Of course, I should do it myself, but my time is finite. Uh, that's interesting and close to what I want. Uh, what, whatever GitHub uh, Opilot suggested here. But that's not the exact endpoint. Let's actually do like put uh, API run. Maybe it's going to do its job now. It's working for sure. But yeah, I'm going to try to do, this, do it myself. Uh, so I'll need to build a client from the routing, right? So I need to wrap this in routing again. Uh, instance, what else do we need? Nothing, just this. 
I don't even need to specify that it's an IO. And also we need like some input and output, like whatever. I think we can go with the empty hash again. And map it to a system state with an empty map. Or actually non-empty map, it's fine. Key to value. Key to value, and this is gonna be a write. And also I think I'll add something to the hash, like 40, 100, just two bytes. And yeah, let's find the input. So the input is going to be, oh God, I need to do it again. Um, I need to do another import. Uh, I need Circe DSL, un unless we already have that, or Circe literal. Oh no, wait, that's not available in Scala 3 yet. That's, that's a pity. Okay, we're going to do it in a different way. We're going to actually parse it. So... And I'm going to do a get. So normally in Scala 2, what I would use is the Circe uh, literal library. Uh, it is nice because you can do something like this. JSON. And this will be parsed to JSON at compile time. And you can even int interpolate values into it. But sadly, we cannot do that um, in Scala 3. There's no... The, the, the macros are not implemented yet, I think. I think. Maybe it's done. I don't want to spend time trying to find out. Um, yeah, so I'm going to define the, the, the body. So the input um, is just the hash. So I guess just value um, 40, 100. So that's our input. And the output, I wonder if we should be doing this uh, without like Circe codex. Yeah, I guess that's like a good uh, example. The whole point right here is that we will not rely on the Circe decoding logic or encoding logic. We just like specify what the expected input and output are in terms of just HTTP and plain text or plain text JSON responses and requests. Uh, I cannot do get because this is an either. Uh, can I do two option get? If I don't care, I know this will succeed. If it doesn't, I want to find out while writing the test. Also, let's start running the test. Yeah, so this so far works. Uh, let's just make sure that it does work. Yep, it's, it's running. Um, so this is our input. And the expected output is going to be something like Oops. What's the problem? Oh yeah, it's just indentation. Uh, also the wrong kind of, yeah. Okay, so the output is gonna be a system state with k to v. So the name of the map is all. There we go, okay. This is accurate, but yeah, that was a mistake. So the good thing is that I can add as much white space as I want, so I, I don't have to do like a strip margin here on a multi-line string, because this will be parsed to an, an adjacent AST, and this is what we're gonna use. Uh, again, I need to do two option get. So we're gonna compare that when I run the endpoint, um, with this input, I'll get this output. So, um, when we when we create a client, which I guess we can still do here, uh, client, oops, from HTTP app. Like we're still not using the Steve client logic. I, I hope you understand that. So when we run, like result, exec, um, expect. Here we're going to define our request, so it's going to be get, uh, put, input. We might need to import this, uh, although I 
thought it, we would get it from the DSL. Okay, I guess we still need to import like uh, the the status or the method actually. Okay, we also need to specify the URI, of course. Um, this is gonna be. Uh, we could specify host, I think, but we can also pro probably provide like a relative path on the host. So API run. We just need. Uh, what's your problem here? Is that why? No. Here. Yeah, we just need the import for the. Uh, for the URI interpolator. Okay, what else? So we have the input, like the, the URI. Um, come on. Then the headers. Or first the body, then the URI. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Ambiguous implicit arguments. Entity decoder. Yeah, we need to specify what the result is. So I'm going to just say JSON uh, from Cersei. And this is an AO of JSON. Okay. I'm actually gonna move it down and get rid of the result here. I'm gonna just say assert IO with this request and the output here. And hopefully that's gonna work. Here's the value what? Oh yeah, that's again indentation. And that failed because method not allowed because I'm just stupid and forgot that this is a, po a post. Um, so remember, we're all sometimes stupid, especially me. Okay, so now about this, I think uh, we're fine. So hopefully the idea of this whole test is clear. Like, I don't want to rely on any of the code from, uh, from the client. And also I don't want to rely on automatic, you know, automated derivation of the codex on the input, like the, you know, on the caller side, let's say. So if I did use like, you know, I defined like a, this hash and I said, ask JSON and sent this and the format of the hash changes, the test will still pass. I want it to fail in that situation so that I'll have to update the test and I'll be aware that the API definition changed in a way that's probably breaking. So yeah, on the server, I'm using data types because I have to, like there is no point in using different, like getting rid of routing here would be pointless. Like if I specified, you know, like HTTP routes uh, of, and I specified like the, the exact, uh, root API run. If I specify the logic here, then the whole po test is pointless because I'm not testing anything. It's just like a spec of my API, which is not even verified for compatibility with the actual server. But if we do it like we did, then this is testing the server uh, for compatibility with the definition of the API in kind of plain texty form. Although, you know, we don't always have to do this. I only did this for here for the example, uh, but yeah. um, when you're in control of both sides and they are in, let's say one application, maybe you don't have to do this. If they are like different modules, different uh, separately deployed, you can do this kind of thing, uh, but it's going to require changes every time you change the format, which is maybe what you want, maybe not. Uh, just know that you have the option to do it. Uh, or, or... And also if I change this like to anything else, uh, the test will fail, right? Because we, we got a slightly different... Uh... No, wait, that's, that, that's actually the server. So the map lookup here are failed with like a no such element exception, I guess. Uh, is that the problem? Okay, we don't even see that. So it would be nice to see the exact exception. Um, we can do that next, like this error handling. So I'll write down what I mean by that. Uh, actually logging. 
uh, show Wait, is that actually the problem? It isn't the code exception. Oh no, that's a different thing. It failed because 400, uh, like 1000 is not a valid byte. Let's change to something like 101. Okay, now we have an internal server error. Did we see uh, the actual exception here? We did. Okay, so I don't need to do anything for that. Uh, so just doing the logging in a way, like probably moving off of a self for j to something else would be nice. Uh, we'll see, we'll see about that. Or like using uh, log for cats to do the logging inside the interpreter, so like in routing. Uh, log, server log. Yeah, probably we're gonna have to specify this. But I think that's gonna go to the next episode because I'm running out of time. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'll just write it down for future episodes. All right, uh, let me just fix this test again. So a hundred here and commit this. Also, I hope I can remove the supply. I don't know why it's previously said I couldn't do this. Like in here. Okay, that's that's an okay error. Um, how about this? Okay, that still works, but there's no body. Okay, fine. Yeah, we we did previously see an error that was kind of weird. I guess because of the lack of the simplicity import. So do I do I really need this client DSL? I do. Okay. Fine. Fine. Uh, right. And uh, test update workflows. Okay. So yeah, I think this is it for this episode. Um, let's just sum up quickly what we did. Uh, we added these compatibility tests. Uh, which I think is really nice, really important to have. Uh, the ability to verify that the errors are encoded and decoded in a specific way, or at least that the server and the client do it in a compatible way, uh, that's really nice. And also without starting a server, that's super cool. Uh, we also added this routing test just to verify that this is the exact representation that we have in this endpoint. Uh, of course, you could do this uh, like one by one have the same amount of tests and the same kind of tests here uh, in in the compact test and in the routing tests to verify like all the edge cases. So for example, what if I pass an empty array? What if this returns an empty map? Or uh, if there's like a union of re results or possible errors, you also want to test each case of that, right? So you could do this. I don't want to do it here because it's just too boring for our uh, project, which is not real and so on. We don't need this degree of, of safety. Um, also, I just realized, did this run out? Yeah, we ran out of uh, time on, on CRISP, that's all right. Uh, anyway, uh, this is what we did. And we also, well, as part of that, as part of the testing, we did make changes to our routing uh, to add this exception handler in the, in the server and also in the in the client um, client executor, in here uh, we did add this uh, this case for catching internal server errors and parsing them as generic server error. So uh, unless we add any kind of code in main in the server, uh, like on top of this, unless, if I do something more with this HTTP app that I get, all the throwables raised by the server. Uh, while it's processing a response, will be surfaced to the client uh, as generic server error. Uh, and yeah, that's 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 good because we don't expose uh, the, the extra details that we don't want exposed. And also it, it parses as a, as a JSON. Uh, we can later like maybe come up with different error codes like in routing, 
we are free to return different kinds of value here. This is just a generic one. Uh, maybe you could return like server failed while processing endpoint Y or endpoint X, right? Uh, what else do we have here? Do we have the body? We have the input, like the request. Uh, maybe there's a way to get like the input from it, the body. Uh, I guess we can look at that at some later time. But still, I guess we might not be able to see the body because it might already have been consumed. Uh, anyway, this is what we did, error handling, uh, compatibility testing. Uh, I think we are right on track. And in the next episode, we'll probably uh, start implementing the logic. So implement real business logic. So this is going to be mostly server-side work. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll gather some more ideas uh, in the meantime, but that this is going to take uh, some time for sure, uh, even without the caching. Uh, later on, we'll introduce caching, like a storage system, uh, a bunch of interesting stuff. We'll do like an in-memory storage system. Later on, we can use uh, a database like Redis or, or even Postgres or uh, something more fancy. Uh, we can implement it in a way that we'll be able to switch, uh, maybe even at runtime, <laughs> who knows? Uh, so there's a lot that we can keep doing here. If you have any ideas of things that you want to see, uh, any specific libraries from the type level ecosystem that you would like to see, uh, or functional libraries in general, uh, let me know. Uh, let me know in the comments. Let me know what you thought, think about this video, uh, the length and so on. And yeah, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode.